We're in Jonah chapter 2 this morning. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there. Jonah 2, really going to begin, begin in verse 17 of the last previous chapter. So the last verse of chapter 1 seems to be kind of an odd transition. So the last verse flows into chapter 2. So. Go ahead and read that for us, beginning in verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, that's the grave, I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. And I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, and to your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon so Jonah has gotten himself into quite a mess, right? He's uh, a prophet. He's been commanded by God to go to this horrible pagan city of Nineveh and preach to them and warn them that God's going to destroy them if they don't repent. And if you remember the kind of descriptions I gave last time of how these people acted, you can understand why God was ready to destroy them. They're very brutal people. And after God commands this to Jonah, he runs away. Right? He goes the opposite direction. He's supposed to go to Nineveh east, but he goes west to Tarshish, all the way to Spain, or he tries to. And the reason is because he does not want them to repent. He does not want these the people in Nineveh to get right with God. These are horrible, brutal people, and Jonah wants them destroyed because they're so evil. Right? He, he didn't want them spared. Uh, he didn't want them to repent and turn to God. So the, the, the Bible doesn't even tell us that Jonah was afraid of what they would do to him. He was afraid that they would repent. He was afraid God would be gracious to them. So he runs. Runs away from God, is what he thinks, right? But to no avail. He foolishly thinks that if he runs, he can escape God's presence. But God instead pursues Jonah. As I mentioned last time, God certainly could have just chosen somebody else who was more willing to go to Nineveh, someone who was more dedicated to Yahweh, someone who was more obedient or had a greater love for enemies than then Jonah, certainly he could have found somebody. He could have let Jonah just continue on in his rebellion, but he didn't. So he pursued Jonah and sent a serious trial his way, I believe for the sake of Jonah himself, because God disciplines the children whom he loves. And so when Jonah is caught up in a storm and ends up near death and, and is swallowed by this fish, it demonstrates that God loves him. God could have left him in his sin. But he pursued him and sent these extreme difficulties his way as a means to cause Jonah to repent. And in, in chapter 2 here, we see a repentant heart and a thankful heart in Jonah. Uh, and Jonah's quite a unique character, right? He, the book of Jonah portrays this, this prophet in a very kind of earth, earthy, human way. And I think because of that, it makes, us, makes it easier for us to identify with Jonah. He's, he's not this, you know, 
a scholar in the ivory tower or this prophet that's just, uh, you know, this near perfection. Uh, this guy's full of faults and sins and very much like us. He makes these boneheaded decisions like us. Stubborn, wants to do his own thing just like us. He knows what God wants him to do and yet he does the opposite. Right? Kind of like Paul in Romans chapter 7. He knows what God wants him to feel and he does the opposite. Much like you and me. So there's a lot about Jonah that we, we don't look at him as someone we want to emulate, right? Um, because he's just screwing up so much. There's a lot about him that, if we're honest, reminds us a little too much of ourselves. Running from God, maybe complaining, not loving our enemies. Uh, but here, in chapter 2, there is something about Jonah that is worthy of emulation. And we should all strive to have the same response to trials as Jonah did when he was swallowed by the whale. And that is namely to give thanks and praise to God in the midst of trials, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of darkness. And the question is, and how do we do that? How do we get to that place of genuine thanksgiving and praise, even in our darkest times? Well, let's look a little bit closer at what just happened to Jonah himself. The first thing I think we need to ask is, and I just realized I did not put the microphone up here, Sorry for those listening. Probably. You can still hear it, you just have to mix okay. it up. Yeah. That's probably better. Um, the first thing I think we need to ask is where did these trials come from? The first difficulty that came Jonah's way was the storm. Right? Where did the where did the storm come from? Back to chapter one. Was this just a random act of nature? After all, there's, there's storms all over the world at any given time, right? Every single day, there's always storms. Was Jonah just at the wrong place at the wrong time? Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 4, the, the, just the first part of that. It says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. So the Lord sent the storm. God sent the storm. The devil didn't send the storm. God did. Right? God created nature, God controls nature however he wants, however he sees fit. And then Jonah is thrown overboard and then swallowed by fish, or if it, if it happens today, we might have a different classification that might be considered a whale. We don't, we don't know what this creature was. But where did this fish come from? And he just happened to be, again, at the right place at the right time. And Jonah's floating down um, sinking and just so happens this fish comes and there's his favorite snack a person and he just swallows him um, just, a, a, just a happenstance right? it just so happens to be there what does the Bible say verse uh, 17 we just read chapter 1 and the Lord appointed a great fish the Lord appointed, or some translations say, prepared the fish to swallow Jonah. God sent the fish. God commanded the fish. You say, God made this fish swallow Jonah. And then it says in verse 10 at the end of chapter 2, uh, that God spoke to the fish and vomited, then vomited Jonah out on dry land. Right? He, he's telling the fish what to do, and he does it. As likely in the fish's mind, he's just swimming by, and Jonah, he thought Jonah would make a good meal, and he swallows him up. Um, and then later, when God speaks to the fish, maybe the fish's stomach hurt, right? And he couldn't digest Jonah, so he spits him out, right? It's, he's just probably doing his thing, yet all at the control in the hand of God. I, it's doubtful that this fish had literally heard the voice of God, and it's commanded and is listening like a dog listens to its owner or something like that. Um, it's doubtful they had a literal conversation. Right? But since God created this fish, he can do whatever he wants to. He can control it. 
And I think God does the same thing even with people to some degree, and they don't even realize it, right? People do their own thing. They choose to do their own thing, and God uses that or has them accomplish things that he needs. He even does this with unbelievers. But for example, in the Bible, uh, Romans chapter 13 tells us that all authorities, all earthly authorities, are appointed by God. Even authorities that people vote in, right? A democratic type of system. No matter what, we could say, oh, those leaders are there because people voted for him or her or whatever. Um, but the Bible is clear that, yes, on the surface, that's what it appears to be, but those leaders are appointed there by God, even if they're tyrants, right? Um, so those could be part of God's judgment on a nation, even. If God wants to put somebody in there bad, he'll do it. Proverbs 21 1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Right? So God is ultimately in control over all of nature and all of mankind. He's in control over his creation, and we see that with the sending of the storm, the sending of the fish to swallow Jonah. So, it's very important, I say all this, so that you understand that every trial, every storm, whether it's literal or metaphorical, is sent to you by God. It's sent to you by God. Jonah realizes and confesses to God in verse 3 of chapter 2, says, For you cast me into the deep into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows pass over me. Jonah nearly drowned. He's sinking in the water moments away from death, and he says that God threw him in there, into the deep. He didn't say that hey, soldiers, uh, sailors did that. He didn't even say he threw himself in there. And he said, you threw me in there. And it was God's ways that were covering him and, and, and going to kill him. And oftentimes I think we get distracted by the means of our trials, and then we, we forget about where these things come from. So the first thing we have to get right is we're to be thankful towards God during dark times or hard times is to acknowledge that the trial we're experiencing is from God himself. God can use a million different things to bring about that trial, but ultimately, that's not what matters. Right? What matters is knowing that it's sent by God. Jo Jonah could have blamed the sailors for throwing him overboard, but he didn't. He said God cast him into the sea. He could have blamed Mother Nature for the storm, but he didn't. And he, he said those, those waves were God's waves that he sent him. He could have blamed the stupid fish for swallowing him. But it says the Lord sent the fish. So who do you blame, or what do you blame for trials? Seems the whole world is undergoing trials from this, this virus, I think. If it's not health problems from this thing itself, or losing loved ones, it's also social problems. People feeling isolated, economic problems, financial problems, people being shut down, having their livelihoods stolen from them. Because of a tyrant, perhaps, that God actually put in office, perhaps as a means of judgment, right? All kinds of problems and trials associated with what's going on. And then, totally unrelated, everyday trials that people go through. A lot of people are sick. Many people die from this virus, and not from the virus. So who do you blame? We blame, we blame the Chinese Communist Party, right, for, for sending this. We can blame Trump. We can blame Cuomo. We can blame Fauci. We can blame the hospitals and the doctors. You can blame the neighbor who gave it to you. Maybe you could pinpoint exactly where this virus came from and who's to blame for every life that's affected. You've got it all narrowed down to a T, but what, what good is that going to do? At the end of the day, this virus and everything attached to it came to this country, came to this world for that matter, because God sent it. We need to realize that. God sent this. And until you realize that, 
you're going to continue to be angry, bitter, and blame everyone and everything for something that God himself has sent. Some of you know I have a, as I mentioned, a dear friend of mine was fighting for his life for 10 days or so because of this thing yesterday, he passed away, 55 years old. Seemed completely healthy. God took him home. How did he get the virus? Why did it hit him so hard? Who, who passed it to him? I have no idea. All I know is God sent it to him. God did. Not Satan. God. Why? I don't know. God knows, and God loves him because he's one of his children. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So it does no good to sit around and complain and try to blame people and point fingers when it's God who sends these things. Yes, we take whatever reasonable precautions we can to not get sick or to not spread it. But don't think for a moment that your precautions are going to thwart the will of God. If God wants to send illness your way, you're getting it. Whether it's coronavirus, whether it's cancer, whether it's heart attack, or anything else. If God intends to send the storm your way, there's nothing you can do to stop it. And I'm not trying to sound doom or gloom here and throw caution into the wind. But every trial sent to the believer is sent to them out of love. So it's not doom and gloom. And this all happened to Jonah because God loved him. Jonah was in sin. And God had to bring him near death so that he would cry out to God and repent. He, he didn't say, he remembered the Lord. In verse 7, he says, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. Sometimes that's what it takes. Right? For basically to be on your deathbed, so to speak, to repent and get right with God. So you need to do away with thinking that everything bad happens in life is not from God and only the blessings and good things are from God. It's both and, not either or. The Bible talks about this. Lamentations 3, 37. Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Job, Job chapter 2, when Job's health was afflicted and he had boiled all over his body, his wife says to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And he said, if you speak as one of the foolish women would speak, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And some people would say, well, Job was wrong to say that, but right after that says, well, this Job did not sin, but his Lord sin. Job was right. He made so it's foolish to think that God does not send bad things our way. Like, if bad things happen, he's just there to help us through it. It's important to make a distinction here, and that is that God does not cause us to sin. Right? God is not the author of sin. God did not make Jonah run away. Jonah did that because he wanted to. So while God does send bad things, or what we would call bad things, or hard things in our life, he never causes us or entices us to sin. And certainly these things happened because Jonah sinned, because he decided to run away from God, and because he did not love his enemies. So for the believer, there are consequences to our sins, and those consequences, which serve as discipline for us, the consequences come from God himself. So in order to have a thankful heart towards God, even in dark times, as Jonah did here, the first step is to acknowledge that the difficulty, the trial that you're facing is coming from God himself. That's really the first step. And then once you acknowledge that this is coming from God, the next thing to do is to cry out to him. Look at verse 2. Well, really, verse 1. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, out of the belly of the grave, I cried, and you heard my voice. So Jonah is quite literally almost 
quite literally, at rock, at rock bottom. He's sinking in the ocean to his death, seaweeds wrapped around his head. And God has put him there, and in response to that, he cries out to God. If God has brought this upon him, certainly he knows God's the one who can deliver him. So when God's heavy hand and discipline comes our way, we're not to continue to run away from him, but to run towards him, to, to cry out to him, to seek after him. The hand that sends the calamity to us can also deliver us from it. Amen. Job 5, 17 and 18. Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Discipline, right? Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. And even if God does not deliver us some, from, from some physical calamity, he certainly can and he will deliver our souls from despair and draw us closer to him. He teaches us through his discipline, which at times can seem very heavy, almost too much to bear. But it is when God's hand seems heaviest upon us that when then we are to run to him for healing. The hand that wounds us will also heal us. Jonah is doing just that here in the belly of the fish. And in this case, Jonah was physically delivered from death. And as I said, he may not be delivered from a specific trial or tribulation. And there, there are lots of people praying for my, my friend Vinny to be healed, but he wasn't. You're not guaranteed to be delivered from the depths of the grave. And certainly we're all going to die one day, so we can't expect that to always be delivered from. But you can certainly be guaranteed to have your soul delivered from spiritual death, from condemnation, from judgment. Because Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. If you turn from your sin and you trust in Christ alone, you will be saved. That's a promise, right? Your, your body will die here one day, but you will be united forever with Christ in heaven. That's ultimately what matters. Death is not the worst thing for the Christian. Far from it. For the unbeliever, it is. That is the worst thing. But for the Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So as a Christian, you may cry out to God to deliver you from an ailment or even death. But don't cry out to God simply to ease your pain. Cry out to God to draw closer to Christ because that's why he sends these these hard things are way to bring us closer to himself. Ask the Lord to show you what sin you have in your life that needs to be removed so that you can be closer to God, closer to Christ, more like him and have this, and, and more intimate walk with him. If you're in Christ, you have the, the tremendous blessing of being able to cry out to God and for him to actually listen to you. As Jonah said, I, I call out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. What a blessing it is that we can cry out to God and have him hear us. But that blessing that you and I so often take for granted, that came at a tremendous cost. We can cry out to God and have God listen to us because Jesus was forsaken by the Father on the cross. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what you and I deserve, or to be separated from God, to have God not hear us when we cry. But Jesus took that punishment upon himself, that condemnation upon himself, that curse of being separated from God. He, he took that upon himself so that by faith you can be united with him. You can be one with him. Jesus was not delivered from the grave. Jesus was not delivered from the cup of God's wrath on the cross that you could be, so that you could be spared from that. He died and was laid in the grave like Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Jesus said that himself. So that you can have your sins washed away and so that you can live forever. 
because of what Christ has done for us at the cross, and we have hope. Right? Even in the darkest times, we still have hope. Look at verse 4. He said, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Sounds depressing, right? I'm driven away from your sight. He says, Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. There will be many dark times, many valleys to go through in this life. God's hand oftentimes seems heavy, but he will heal us. He will restore our souls, as, as he says in, in, in Psalm 23, right? He restores my soul. He wounds, but he also heals. And it's for our own good, it's for his, for his glory. So go to him for healing if he has wounded you. The God who drives us down to the pit is the one who can and does bring us up out of it. Verse 6, he says, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Here's how he brought up out of the pit. Verse 7, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you and to your holy temple. So it took Jonah to be almost dead, to cry out to God. God's hand was heavy upon Jonah. He was physically sinking. Probably felt like God was just pushing him down into the water. And when he got to as low as he could go, he cries out to God. Obviously, probably not with his mouth, because he's underwater. And God delivered him. And God caused him, through this, to repent. That's what his heavy hand did to him. It caused him to go back to God and run towards God and no longer away from him. And that is the purpose of the trials that God sends our way, to bring us to him. And through this heavy discipline, Jonah learns a lesson. He says in verse 8 and 9, Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said this about those two verses. He said, Jonah learned this sentence of good theology in a strange college. He learned it in the whale's belly, at the bottom of the mountain, with the weeds wrapped around his head. Most of the grand truths of God have to be learned by trouble. They must be burned into us with the hot iron of affliction, otherwise we will not truly receive them. I think that's true. That most of God's truths, most of what we learn about God, are not really found in theology books, as helpful as they might be, but it's found through trouble. Burned into us with the hot iron of affliction. Hebrews chapter 5 tells us that Jesus Although he was a son, learned obedience through what he suffered. And if Jesus learned obedience through suffering, how much more do you and I need to learn it through suffering? John had to learn obedience by being thrown into the ocean, and swallowed by a whale. It was only after that traumatic experience that he repented and cried out to God. Notice verse 8, he says, Those who pay regard to vain idols, forsake their hope of steadfast love. The hope that we have, the glimmer of light we see during dark times is found in the steadfast love of God. I was talking to somebody yesterday, an unbeliever, and he said, the light at the end of the tunnel is actually a train coming. You know, it's... 2020 has been just a rough year. Oh, there's a light in the tunnel. It's a train. We're going to get run over, right? But not for the believer. The light that we see at the end of the tunnel is the steadfast love of God. The relentless, pursuing love that God has for his children. And the greatest reminder that we have of this love for us is found at the cross. That is where the hope is found. Our hope is found in the gospel. That's where we run to. That's what we remind ourselves of every day. Even 
when, or I should say, especially when he sends trials and tribulations our way. And if you run to anyone or anything other than God, you're doing what Jonah says here, and you're putting your faith in vain idols, right? just like those pagan sailors who cry out to their gods to calm the storm, right? Nothing happened. The prophets of Baal cutting themselves, screaming out for their God to send down fire. Nothing happened. But when those sailors on the boat there with Jonah, when they listened to what he said to do about the one true God, the storm stopped. Right? God himself is the only one that we should look to in times of trouble. And all too often, I think we, we give in to the temptation to go to anything or anyone other than God. So where do you go when God sends trials your way? You find yourself drowning your sorrows in distractions. You kind of just take, take your mind off of things like entertainment. You just binge watch shows or something. You feel the need to, to, to vent on social media to make you feel better. You're blaming others for the things that God sent when you seek deliverance from trials from anything other than God, you are committing idolatry, right? Because you're saying, God sent this thing my way, and I'll find deliverance through this thing other than God. This is what will save me from this. This is what will make me feel better. You're saying this earthly thing or things or even this person will be my savior in this situation. As Jonah said, salvation belongs to the Lord. Yes, the discipline belongs to the Lord, but so does the salvation belong to him. No earthly thing or person can save you but God himself. And sometimes it takes us to hit rock bottom to finally realize that. You may wonder why God allowed this, what God, God allowed that to happen, but he sends difficulties and darkness your way so that you too will see that salvation belongs to the Lord alone. And any other attempts to be delivered from that are idolatrous. God sends the trials so that we seek him for deliverance. And after this hard, scary lesson, Jonah was indeed delivered. In verse 10, the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out on the dry land. God heard Jonah's cry and delivered him from death. So is the moral of the story that you know every time you cry out to God uh, in a bad situation, He's going to deliver you from it. And if He doesn't, maybe it's just you're just lacking faith. Right? Is that is that the moral of the story? No, because we know that's not true. We know that God doesn't always remove the things that we want to be removed. When it comes to the story of Jonah. And we compare this to what Christ has done for us, we can see something that, that does happen or can happen all of the time. Because Jesus died on the cross, was buried just like Jonah, was in the belly of the whale, and then Jesus rose from the dead, just like Jonah was spit out on dry land. So the victory that Jesus had over death can be yours. You may not be physically delivered from death, and that's okay. But eternal life. Can be yours. The curse of sin can be removed from yours. That's what Jesus said. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So there will come a day when you physically die, and God will not deliver you from your physical death. But that's okay if you have Christ, because if you have Christ, you have resurrection power. You have eternal life. And that's far more important than any temporary deliverance from trial. Can you imagine the joy and the relief that Jonah had when he made it on the dry land? Even though he was vomited by a fish out, I mean, you can't even imagine what that's like, or the slime and gross, partially digested fish covering you, the smell. He probably didn't care at all. He was out of there and on dry land, probably jumping for joy. He was given grace and another chance. And that's what it should be like for us. That even though there are times of heavy discipline 
by God. God's hand almost seems too heavy. And there's times of sorrow and darkness. We must remember how Christ has given us eternal life. That we deserve to be tossed into the lowest hell for our sin. As Jonah was tossed to the bottom of the sea. But God has saved us and delivered us out of the depths of the grave. And if we cry out to him, he will hear us. Some of you here, maybe some of you listening and watching online, are going through dark and trying times. There's so many people hurting right now for many different reasons, and I want to encourage you that through Jesus Christ, even death itself is defeated. That's the one thing everybody fears, but for the Christian, you don't. And one day, every tear will be wiped away, and there will be no more death. There will be no more Jesus is going to conquer all of death at his return. That is the hope that we have to look forward to. And it's all because Jesus rose from the dead, just like Jonah was spit out of the fishes. Now, let's pray. God, I thank you for your loving hand of discipline. I thank you for your steadfast love that pursues us and causes us to by your grace to repent when we run from you. Keep us from wandering from you. Help us to fix our eyes upon Christ and his kingdom, to not be distracted, Lord, with trials, but to use those trials as a, a way that we can draw closer to you. I pray for all those who are suffering and hurting right now that are hearing this. God, I pray that you would comfort them with the beauty of Christ, that they don't know you, that they would turn to you and be saved from the condemnation that they deserve and they would have eternal life. For those who do know you, God, that you would encourage them that they have the resurrection power that Christ has and that they have nothing to fear and that you are in control of all things. We pray this all in Jesus' name.